So as we say uh, often, uh, you know, common tropes on Geek Nights are one, if an anime movie comes out, just go see it. There aren't that many right. that aren't like Naruto. If eights. there is a full length animated feature and it's in, you know, it's usually, there's not a lot of those in the world made each year that are at, you know, top production value that quality. aren't just one piece 50 the search for the second right. piece. if you don't count all the ones that are one piece 50 or pokemon <laughs> 30 or you know compilation of pokemon some anime, 30 ash is right? still nine about for some or, reason original theatrical animated feature films from japan or from other countries say ireland uh, <laughs> right? song and, of the sea or even the, or even the united states right not many of those are produced at the top levels of production value every year it's worth it to see pretty much all of them yep if you are a fan of animation so uh, especially when they are made by a top name director studio so mamaru hosoda who you may know from such, man. from such films as that digimon movie that people say is the good one that i haven't seen the one piece movie that's the good one that we did review yes uh, the Summer girl who War. leapt through time. Yep, Summer Wars. Wolf Summer Children. Wars. Boy and the Beast. Wolf Children. Where you know as much is as that all of them? Uh, yeah, Boy and the Beast. Yeah, that's it. Was Boy and the Beast the last one we saw? Yeah. Okay. So, anyways, new movie. Mirai no Mirai. Is Mirai of the future? Right. The girl's name is Mirai. You'll which, just which see means, it as Mirai in most means, places. It means future. Uh, it came out in Japan of July this year in the summer. And it was released in the United States, a limited theatrical release from G-Kids. Yep, the other thing we always usual. say is that if you live in a major city in the U.S., like one of the five, mm -hmm. every anime movie is just in the theaters. Right. It used to be that we would have to go to like, we we actually saw Mamoru hosted it in person when, was it Summer Wars? Yeah, I think, right? I think we, so. They, yeah, they screened Summer Wars. Yeah, because the kids, all the kids were asking about King Cosma. Right, it was it was like, the, it, was the, it was the film festival. They screened it at the Director's Guild. We go there and host it as there. It's probably Geek Nights episode about it. There definitely is. <laughs> but the point is, we used to have to do that to see this anime on the screen in the U.S. But now it seems like any, everything the G Kids licenses is just in the local theater. We went yeah. to the theater in Astoria. Yeah, just like a movie theater on in a Queens. Wednesday night. It's a normal movie theater. Yeah, and there it is because of what the Fathom events, whatever. Subtitled though the dub was on well, Saturday. Wednesday night was subtitled and Saturday was dub. So you know you just took the schedule, right? So the the short ant version of our review is you should go see it, and also Mama Rosita. Even if it was bad, you should go see. It. But Mama Rosita is like. What, like, we're in a weird golden age. He is one of several people who's just batting a thousand here. Yeah, well, it's pretty much, you got a Makoto Shinkai. Yep. You got a Hosoda. You had Satoshi Khan. You had Satoshi Khan. Uh, Miyazaki, I guess, is not retired. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll not really batting a thousand, but batting like 980. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, uh, and then I guess you got the Studio Panak, which is not, which, not... Oh, the, not they, really batting a thousand. They've but had an at they're bat. They're batting. They've had an at bat. Yeah, and I guess <laughs> production IG also puts something in there once in a while, right? Yeah. I see. You know, they did. But Hosoda, oh, and then we also got, um, um, you know, the the walk on girl. What's his name? Oh, uh, Yuasa. Yeah, it's Masaki Yuasa. Oh, Yuasa. Yuasa's <laughs> batting a thousand, but he's not playing baseball. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's definitely he's definitely playing Calvin Ball. Anyway, uh, but those are those are your major anime directors these days. Sadly, none of them are ladies. But anyway, but look at Hosoda. <laughs> uh, uh, he basically he made a Digimon movie that was actually good. He made a One Piece movie that was actually. I don't good. know if the Digimon people say it was good. I haven't seen it. But uh, I'm I'm confident based on the people I know who've said it's good. Anyway, so the new movie he came out with is Mirai no Mirai. We went. We're like, oh, let's go see that, and we did. So what it's it's just what it's about is about basically that same old cliche story of there's a kid in a family and the family has another baby. Right, he's got a new young sibling, and there's this jealousy, you know, of like, oh, my parents aren't paying enough attention to me. This Which is like it's a oldest, cliche because it literally happens. This is the oldest story in the book. I've never experienced it myself, but I imagine other people do, because otherwise, why would people tell this story if it didn't happen in any families? Yep. Uh, even though it didn't happen in my family, so I can't really relate to it. But I've seen the story play out in so many different mediums over time that like it's it's very familiar i've seen other people i know who have kids who have seen it play out right. live yes and this as so you took that core idea and expanded it into what is this thing like 90 minutes two, two hours something into a full-length animated feature film 98 minutes uh, that is actually much the story it actually shows even though that's the core of it is much grander uh 
than that one aspect. Well, I guess in general, it's it's another it's a very different movie in some ways from what he's done before, but in other ways, it's the same movie in that he's like all his movies. They focus on like some idea of what a family is mm -hmm. and do it especially really, really well. Right. Especially Summer Wars was about this big awesome family and the sort of person who wasn't in the family coming to them for their at their reunion time. Yep. Right. Uh, Wolf Children's about like a small isolated family and I like the pains I didn't see of the Wolf Children. <laughs> what really? Uh, but the Boy and the Beast was about like you know. Scott the... Wolf Children, I think, is his best movie. Maybe I haven't seen it. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but Boy and the Beast, right? It's sort of like about you know adoption, right? Where it's like this adopted parent, but also beast. parents that aren't great potentially and dysfunctional right. families. All his movies are about a family in the same way that all Makoto Shinkai's movies are about clouds. But Mirai right? is interesting in that there's two ways to look at it. It is on one hand a fantastical movie about a young child who meets his ancestors and his future self and his future sister when she grows up and has these experiences across space and time that are going to shape him into the person he's going to become. But it's also a story where there are literally no fantastical elements whatsoever, and it's the story of a kid who synthesizes the family photos and the stories that older relatives tell to each other with his own imagination and is shaped by those two experiences, those two things, to become the person that he will be. Mm -hmm. And all the fantastical experiences are literally just a child's animation seeded by, like, you know, when you're a kid, like, you hear the story grandma tells about that time grandpa shot somebody, yep. and you don't quite get it, and you don't really understand, like, what's going on, but you internalize it, and you imagine things about it, and those stories, like, they impact your growth and development whether or not you even realize it. Mm -hmm. That's what this movie's about. Right. The main center, the, the thing that I really liked about this movie a lot mm -hmm. is that, you know, there are a lot of great uh, American movies, ho old Hollywood movies especially, that are based on plays. For some reason, plays just become really great movies. Like, you can just go down the list. There's, like, tons of amazing plays that became amazing movies. You got Chicago, Cabaret. They all start with C. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but... A lot of those great plays that became movies, say like a 12 Angry Men or a Dial M for Murder, take place mostly in one room. Yep. Right? I love those one rumors, right? You got those, uh, what's that one? Glass Menagerie? Nice, yeah. ni nice one rumor you got there, right? I love the one room play movie things. I just love those. And this is not a one rumor, but it's a one houser. And it's a weird special house. Oh, yeah. So you can tell part of this was important for the movie. And part of it was the animators slash designers slash people who are good at drawing really having fun and really showing off and having a great time because in this movie, the dad is an architect and they have architected this amazing, super well-designed, you know, super fancy house. But it's right? a weird house. That is very unusual. Everyone knows it's weird. In the weird. same way like a Frank Lloyd Wright house is unusual, but it, this is more like... A Japanese. This is like if Muji and Frank Lloyd Wright had a baby. Right? I that, would. I this would is give, like that house. I would give almost anything to live in this house. This well, house is so good. You could have been an architect instead of an IT person. Yeah, like I would build this house. I would hire someone to build this house for me. But if anyway, I could. the 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 point of the house is that it is the the main feature of it that's important for the movie is that there is a yard in the house and the yard is in the middle of the house. So it's like you're going from the. You know, it's like the kitchen bedroom area up top. It sort of slants down, right? And before you get to the front room, where it's like closer to the entrance, there's just there's no ceiling, and there's a patch of grass, and there's a tree. And the tree symbolizes the family tree, and that is sort of, you know, what ties in all those, you know, imaginatory... Uh, fantastical scenes where the kid is seeing his, you know, future or past relatives or self, right, is all through this tree. This tree is sort of like a magical uh, connection to the actual family tree in yep. a way. Right? Which really, like, it fits the, the, like, just as a kid, like, you'd go into the yard, and when you're a kid, the yard feels way bigger than the yard actually mm -hmm. is in the real world. Right. And so, you just have adventures in this yard. So it's, it's kind of interesting, because on the one hand, it sort of plays this role in having this cool fancy architecture and cool house for them to stage their their play in right 
it's a lot of fun to draw, I imagine. And they did. You could tell there's a lot of parts where they're sort of, uh, you know, really getting off on. Like this, the opening scene has the kid like blowing on the the glass and then wiping it away and blowing on it and wiping it away. Yeah. And they're like, check how fancy we can do this <laughs> awesome anime. I'm like watching that and I'm like, how much time did someone spend on that? Well, all those big right? painting look at, look shots with those giant painted backgrounds and right. all that nonsense. They put a lot of monies and time into this animation, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, but also. Right, it's like it wouldn't make a lot of sense for the kid to say go outside where a tree was, right? You know, it's like having that tree in the middle of the house really like makes the story possible to tell the story in the way they want to. I think well, the kid would retreat to the yard in the same way that a real child would retreat into his, like their imagination. Right. There's a couple scenes outside the house. I think where he like goes biking and stuff like that, or like and maybe in the car. There's a little bit. Yep. But 90, 90 plus percent is in the is in the house, right in the different rooms. So the like basically the where where it kicks off, where it goes from just being a story about a family to getting this semi fantastical or not, depending how you read it, uh, thing is right away. The dog is jealous of the baby too, because the dog, which happens with pets, was jealous of the of the first kid when he was born. Yeah, the dog has been in the family longer than the, either of the children. Yep, and it set that up, and basically, like, not re- really spoilers. We're gonna avoid talking about the details of the rest of the movie because just watch a fucking movie. It's good. It's only ninety minutes. Yeah, so you <laughs> got ninety eight like- minutes to spend. You should watch this movie. <laughs> okay. But the kid, it's is- actually gonna be available to watch. You know, outside the theater at home pretty mm-hmm. soon slash easily. So the kid is sort of chance. freaking out about the baby and he goes off to the yard and then suddenly like the yard is a giant palace and he, and it's run down and decayed and he meets this prince. Right, right. So like I didn't know what was going on. I thought I'm like, oh, it's another travel to a different world anime. Like yep. Escaflone. I've seen a thousand of these. Well, all right, whatever. I'm here. I'll watch. And he meets what appears for a second to be a regal prince who then very rapidly appears to be very shabby and self-entitled. Right, and then, it, it like, pretty much right before the character said they were the dog, I'm like, oh, it's the dog. Yep. And then he's like, oh, I'm the dog. And it's I like, ah, used to be I the gotcha. prince of this house, and then I was I, usurped by this piece r- of literally shit Literally right kid. before he said that line, I'm like, oh, it's the dog. And yep. then he says, I used to be prince of this house, and I'm like, I am right. But the movie does something really great in that the dog, <laughs> like, you see the dog, and the dog acts like a real dog, and the dog seems cute. But after you meet the prince and realize that the prince is this personification of the dog, then every time you see the dog after that, the dog kind of has stubble, and you just imagine the dog is this kind of like grumpy, shabby older dude. Right, right. It's like they, intru- you know, even though the dog is a dog, by introducing this personification of the dog in this one brief scene, and then, you know, it's not really there a lot for the rest of the movie. It's just this one imaginative scene with the kid mostly. You know, but then now this dog you gave managed to give it this human personality, right? Without having to do like some sort of Snoopy kind of thing. Yep. Right. And bit by bit, the movie just introduces like it goes through these scenes of the dog, and then a couple other like incidents like that that flesh out the growth of this child, and it basically culminates <laughs> in a very well done child's nightmare yep. scenario, like right. like literally the what like the kind of nightmare a kid would have. Right. So the subplot of this movie, the the main subplot, is the relationship between the two parents, mm. because basically it was a situation where uh you know it's it's Japan first of all, right? So you know uh, <laughs> the, the working culture of Japan got to incorporate that, right? Yep. But, but the mom is right, the executive, the, right? The mom was at home and the dad was out, but now that they had the second baby. The dad is now home, and the mom goes to work, right? And the dad is freelancing architect from home with his laptop, right? And now he's got to take care of the baby and take care of the kid and do all the housey shit, right? You know, it's, it seems... It's got a little bit of a Mr. Mom situation. If any of you are young enough to have seen the movie Mr. Mom with Michael Keaton... Right. It does, but it's not a comedic way. It's presented in a realistic way. And the two parents, they have a very adult and realistic you know, sort of conflict resolution and dealing with their relationship thing that's like, it's so real. It's not, you know, there's nothing corny about it or, you know, none of them are stupid about it, right? It's like they talk to each other and get their shit in order the way adults do in the real world, reasonable adults do, uh, who aren't full of intelligent, non-dramatic real adults in the real world do, (laughs) right? They get their shit together and you see them get their shit together you know, and, and talk about whether they're good parents and, you know, how the relationship is and all that kind of stuff uh, together. 
And that's really nice to see. And it's also good for adults, perhaps who are parents, uh, uh, you know, or were parents <laughs> or whatever, uh, could go and, and connect with that part of the movie as well. It's not just the, you know, the kid jealousy part. So you like this is a must see anime movie and I don't like I don't want to say anything Best else. Just Japan anime movie twenty eighteen? What other Probably came, What else came out twenty eighteen that was a movie that was animated from Japan? I think it's this. Yes. I think it's definitely this. I think it is. I can't remember another one. I could be wrong. Call me out on it. Yeah. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for...